Welcome to the third installment of the Climate Change Series, A Tale of Two Cities in a Hotter World, Los Angeles and Beijing. My name is Luis Chiape, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Research and Collections at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Um, I also happen to be a frequent visitor of Beijing. I have done work in Beijing uninterrupted for about 25 years, so it's very, very interested in today's conversation because I've seen a huge transformation in that city. We are thrilled to host this series here at the Tarpets, an unparalleled wonder, an unparalleled scientific wonder, an active urban field site, where an immersion into prehistoric Los Angeles helps us understand our world now and in the future. The tar pits represent one of the best opportunities anywhere in the world to understand how ecosystems respond to long-term processes of environmental change. So very appropriate for this series. We're proud to partner with UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability on this climate change series. It's a true collaboration in efforts to expand our reach to the communities of Los Angeles. I want to thank the IES director, Peter Cariba, and his staff, including the head of strategic initiatives, David Schleis, for um, co-organizing these panels. I also want to thank uh, the NHM staff, in particular our vice president of um, Education and Programs, Sue O, Laura Robinson, Senior Manager for Public Programs, and Gabe Jorbert, Program Manager. And of course, I want to thank the staff of the Tarpets who are, you know, uh, here and in, in opening uh, uh, their arms to welcome us. Uh, and finally, I also want to thank our sponsor, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. This evening we'll be live streaming on the Tarpets, the NHM, and the IES Facebook pages, which explains why you may see a, a cameraman uh, wandering around. Um, and if you miss some of the um, previous talks, you can find them or you can find audio recordings of them on SoundCloud and iTunes or videos on the Facebook pages. Um, for tonight, it is tough to feel urgency when climate change seems like something happening to future generations and uh, in a faraway land. Now, the reality is that climate change is happening today and it is affecting all of us in every city on this planet. Now, not every place is being impacted in the same way. To make climate change more personal, more local, and more real, let's talk about how it will affect two of the greatest cities in the world, Beijing and LA. We'll compare notes on how each of these cities' uh, infrastructure and governance impacts on their local biodiversity, as well as how residents may react to the changes. Please join me to welcome our moderator, Stephanie Weir, a marine scientist at the Nature Conservancy, the world's largest environmental organization. And thanks again for being here. Thank you. So before I get started on my introduction, um, for those of you that haven't been to the previous um, events, this is an interactive uh, night. So what we want to start with is making sure everybody is ready. So if you haven't already, get out your smartphone, connect to our Wi-Fi here at the museum, and then go to the pollev.com slash IOES. And we will, we actually have a poll active right now. And um, the question is about, I, I don't have it exactly in front of me, but it is about how you feel um, when talking about climate change, right? One word that describes how you feel when talking to someone about climate change, and we want you to be honest. Just, just whatever you want to say is, you know, 
We won't, we won't edit you. <laughs> we want to know how you really feel. So, um, so I want to just start by introducing myself. So I um, am a marine ecologist. I wor have worked for the Nature Conservancy for 16 years. And my focus um, is overall has been on coral reefs. Um, my work evolved, um, has evolved over that time. A lot of my coral reef work was focused on the impacts of climate change and working with resource managers around the world to minimize the impacts of climate change. Um, but then I started getting interested in um, the connections between human health and well-being and environmental health. Um, and so I started getting into an unlikely um, area of looking at sewage and toilets and sanitation, which is not a very um, sexy topic compared to coral reefs, um, but it's really fun and funny, um, as you might imagine, all the potty jokes. Um, but um, what I also spend a lot of time doing at the Nature Conservancy is figuring out how to communicate um, issues around environmental problems, climate change, and how to engage um, audiences in um, taking action. So um, I'm going to ask the panelists in a minute um, to do the same. Um, I want everybody to share, and I'm going to share, what um, the greatest challenge you see um, in, facing, in facing climate change, what's the greatest challenge in overcoming it, and also what um, makes you optimistic about um, meeting those challenges. So um, for me, um, I think the greatest challenge is the today mindset. We have a really, I think, have a hard time imagining the future or taking action towards the future. Um, and so I think getting people to think about the future and understanding that maybe it's not so far off is one of our greatest challenges. Um, what I'm optimistic about is that there's actually been a lot of exciting momentum and coming and collaboration in the last couple of years. The Paris Agreement um, is something that has made me very optimistic um, about addressing climate change. And despite uh, the U.S. federal government um, uh, backing out of their agreements, um, the fact that businesses and states in the U.S. are all stepping up to fill those gaps that our federal government is currently not um, committed to addressing. Um, that's exciting and inspiring and, op and, and really makes me feel optimistic that people are recognizing that it's not just up to our governments to solve this problem, but it's up to um, us individually and as businesses. So um, I think we're going to go ahead and just check in on that poll real quick just to see how everybody's feeling and then um, have our panelists introduce themselves. So juiced. How? <laughs> that's really interesting. That means more than one of you said juiced because that's an indication of how many people answer that question. Somebody, people collaborate on that. Um, <laughs> anxious, <laughs> concerned, worried, angry, hopeful, passionate, protective, knowledgeable, serious, frustrated. Yeah, okay. Hopeful. I like hopeful. Um, okay, we're going to check in on that at the end of this as well. Um, okay, so we've got some confusion tonight. We have two Alexes. So we're going to go with Alex H, Alex W, and then Brad. So Brad makes it easy. <laughs> so let's start with Alex H. If you could um, introduce yourself and, and answer those questions, that would be great. Sure. Um, I study um, climate change from a, from a physical perspective. Um, I have done a lot of work looking at how um, we model the global climate and how we um, can improve our understanding of the mechanisms that shape how um, the climate is changing uh, over time. And recently I've done a lot of work also on, on projecting regional climate change, um, especially here in Los Angeles and in California. Um, and as far as what I think the challenges are. Um, I, I think it's uh, similar to what you said. I think that there's, um, I, I guess my greatest concern is that we're, we aren't changing fast enough, that, that we won't um, ultimately um, reduce our emissions fast enough to make, to make enough of a difference um, for the future. And I, I do think that we are approaching this problem seriously, and I think, I think that's actually what gives me hope and what makes me optimistic is that I, I see so much 
um, interest in this problem, and, and it's, there's a seriousness, especially here in California, um, on, on reducing emissions, and um, it's happening at the highest levels of government, and there really are policy changes in place that are, that are, that are making this happen, but my worry is that it's not happening fast enough. So there's my challenge and my reason for optimism all, all in one. All right. Um, uh, good evening. Thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, my, so my background, I'm on the faculty at the law school at UCLA, and my uh, area of focus is really on China's environmental governance. So I look at Chinese law and politics through uh, the way they regulate their environment. Uh, before that, I was a lawyer, a senior attorney at uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council for about six years, based in Beijing. I helped them set up their uh, Beijing office in 2005 and started a program on environmental law where we worked with uh, regulators, lawyers, NGOs, uh, citizen groups on to, to try to improve transparency, uh, use of the law to enforce uh, environmental laws on the books. And the overarching question was really how do you translate laws on the books into, into action and practice? And that's really uh, what I continue to study in my, in my research. Um, and I, I've been working with, in, with China professionally for now almost 25 years. And, and as our, uh, in, in, our, uh, the person who introduced us earlier said, it's really remarkable to see the changes that have happened in just two and a half uh, decades in, in China. It's uh, created a lot of benefits, but also, as, as we all know, some of the most serious environmental problems uh, in the world. Uh, so uh, as far as the biggest challenge to me, I think the, the biggest challenge that I think about a lot is how does the developing world choose to develop going forward, right? We're talking about billions of people, countries with the largest populations in the world, who are, have aspirations to uh, do as well as uh, the, the people in the United States and in Europe. And the path that they choose to develop uh, will have enormous consequences for our, our future. So I think that's the, the biggest challenge. In terms of what makes me optimistic is having spent time on the ground in China uh, you know, a lot of the news stories we, we get over here um, tend to be quite negative. Uh, and my day-to-day -day experience was the experience of working with a lot of uh, very dedicated people who really wanted to solve some problems. And to know that that was out there is, is a reason for, for me to have optimism. And also coming back to California to reiter reiterate what you said, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't uh, suggest you do this, but if you want to read AB 32 or some of the other California legislation, it's really quite remarkable to read just the opening paragraphs to see, you know, in the pop popular press there's a lot of debate about, you know, is climate change real and this sort of thing, and it's one amazing to look at our state legislation to see the statement of purpose and recognition of the problem, and that's what California is up, up to, and that gives me a lot of uh, cause for optimism. I'm going to remind you guys to, as our AV uh, support said, eat the mic <laughs> so our live stream audience can hear us. I will eat, <coughs> I will eat the mic. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Brad Schaefer. I am a professor in two departments, in ecology and evolutionary biology and in the Institute of Environment and Sustainability, where I run a center called the LaCret Center for California Conservation Science at UCLA. Uh, in terms of my work, I'm a conservation scientist and I do a lot of work in California. I um, am a biologist and I study reptiles and amphibians. So in that sense, I'm very much at home in a museum. I'm a, I'm a biodiversity oriented person. I know a lot about reptiles and amphibians and I study them uh, in nature, in the field, and I tend to use a lot of genetic and genomic tools. So we sequence turtles and salamanders and frogs. And we use that information to learn about their evolutionary history, to learn about their ecology, and then to learn about their, uh, their conservation. So those are, that's the work that I do. Um, the uh, biggest challenge that I see, it's, it's very interesting. For me, the biggest challenge in trying to think about climate change and trying to, to sort of deal with it and cope with it is the details. So, so for me, as a biologist, and especially as a biologist who works on things like little lizards and little salamanders, um, you know, the devil is in the details. So 
it's one thing to say it's going to get four degrees hotter. It's another thing to say we're going to lose all the little moist, tidy holes underneath a rock or underneath a log. And that's what's going to keep the organisms that I work on and care about and care deeply about conserving on our landscapes or we're going to lose them from our landscapes. And to me, I mean, Alex H., the two to my right, um, does a lot of work on, on downscale climate change, right? So at the level of a, of a city block, perhaps. Um, well, you know, I want it at the level of, you know, this cup. I mean, I want it to be really small so that I can really understand those ecological details. And, and for me, in trying to project forward on how the plants and animals that I work on are going to do, that's the challenge. Um, optimism, I, I had to think long and hard about this one, to tell you the truth. But uh, for me, the, my greatest source of optimism right now, aside from, of course, just being in California and, and the inspiration that is California in terms of, of all things environmental, is in talking to a lot of millennials that I spend a lot of time talking to um, over at the university, at least, and as well as my own family, and, and in many ways, the biggest source of optimism for me is that they don't want to be like me. They don't want to own a car. They don't want to drive. They don't want to own a house. They, they want a much more spare, sort of, sort of stripped-down lifestyle that's, that's, you know, easier to move around, more mobile, um, less sort of, you know, stuck with your stuff. And that's an indication to me of a move away from consumerism, which is a move away from many of the issues that are driving climate change at the sort of individual consumption level. So for me, that's, that's a really cool thing that I'm very excited about. Okay, great, thank you. So we are going to play a game tonight. And some of you may have played this game. Um, it's kind of a get to know you game usually. It's called Two Truths and a Lie. And um, typically what you would do uh, amongst maybe people you don't know very well is you give three different quote facts about yourself. And they tend to be fairly outrageous. Um, and then the people have to guess which one is the lie. So what we're going to do tonight is give you um, facts around climate change and some of the um, uh, results of climate change or causes of it and ask you to figure out the lie. So we are going to start. Let's put the first slide up and have Alex W. run us through. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll start with... Um, these facts tend to be a bit of bad news. We'll work our way towards uh, some better news towards the end, I think. But we'll start with the first one here. Los Angeles falls into EPA's worst category for ozone pollution violations. It's called extreme non-attainment. And it's not expected to come into compliance for 15 years. Okay, so that's the first one. Second, uh, outdoor air pollution contributes to 1.2 million premature deaths in China annually nearly 40% of the global total. And then third, we'll show a picture in just a second. This is a January 2013 NASA satellite image of air pollution over Beijing and surrounding regions. Okay. So. Okay, get out your phones. And you should be able to see the poll. Has everybody seen it? And you make your selection. And then we'll start seeing, we're going to start the timer. How long do they have? I love the timer. Hopefully you're not biased by others' answers if you haven't answered yet. <laughs> we have to give it some time. Okay, 
So it looks like what we're seeing here is the majority of you think that Los Angeles falls into the EPA's worst category for ozone pollution violations and is not expected to come into compliance for 15 years. So, Alex, that's their voting on the lie, yeah. sorry. So what is the lie? And can you talk to so us about it? So the lie is the third one. So that's actually a NASA satellite picture of a forest fire in north, uh, sort of the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, if you see an actual satellite photo of Beijing and surrounding regions, it looks quite similar on, on the bad days in Beijing because in some of the, the worst days in Beijing, it, it, we only have that level of pollution in the states during forest fires. And so I, I wanted to make that uh, point. Um, as I think we know, sort of one of the sort of connections between Beijing and LA is uh, a history and a challenge with bad air pollution. And it turns out that Los Angeles is still one of the worst, sort of most air polluted cities in, in the country. And on <laughs> oh, you're cheating, Colin. Now. Lock That's it down. cheating. Lock Colin, this is not, this is not right. <laughs> Did we lose it? What happened? Uh, so, so Los Angeles is in what, uh, under the Clean Air Act, is called extreme non-attainment for ozone. If you, if you look at some of the information from uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, you'll see in particular the violations are really inland, right? The wind it blows in from the ocean, kind of blows pollution in. Uh, the mountains trap it in and sort of inland empire. It bakes during the day and you get you get a lot of uh, a lot of smog, and so um, we we still have a real problem with that. The good news is that on uh, other pollutants like uh, fine particulate PM 2.5, we're doing quite a lot better. There are only uh, some some violations, and we've we've largely come into uh, compliance with that. On on the health effects, unfortunately, number two is true. China does have about 40 percent of the sort of uh, uh, estimated premature deaths globally. India is, uh, is a close second, uh, but uh, those two countries, by virtue of having large populations and a lot of uh, pollution, have uh, a heavy burden from uh, health, uh, you know, sort of health burden from, uh, from pollution. So, okay, so this is a huge health burden um, in, with air pollution. Um, can you talk about what kind of illnesses are associated with um, air yeah. pollution? Yeah, so I, you know, the two pollutants, for example, that we're talking about here, we've talked about ozone and, and particulate. So particulate is the one, PM2.5 is the one that uh, Chinese people have been very focused on uh, recently. In the last few years, it's become well known enough that sort of people are texting around jokes that feature PM2.5. Awareness about it has grown. Uh, quite a lot, but PM2.5 is dangerous because it's very fine, can get deep in your lungs, can enter the bloodstream, it causes lung problems, uh, heart problems, asthma, these types of things, and, and ozone like, likewise can cause lung disease and, and uh, asthma and other, other problems like that. You mentioned when we were talking earlier also about the impacts on young children yeah. and how that affects them. Oh, right, yeah, so one of the um, the things that scared me personally the most, our daughter was actually born in Beijing uh, just before we moved back to California, and I had been reading a lot of uh, children's health studies about the impacts of coal pollution on children, and so there's uh, extraordinarily serious uh, sort of measurable effects on brain development. Birth weight is less for, for, for children born in heavy coal pollution areas. Uh, head circumference is, is lower. IQ at age two is measurably lower, so it's a real, very serious impact from, from air pollution. So is there reason for optimism here, considering the progress LA has made, the pollution has been greatly diminished? Um, is there reason for optimism, and, and what can we learn from what LA has been able to accomplish? Right, so I, so I think Beijing has been really interested in the LA example because they've seen this, um, you know, L LA in terms of air pollution is a, is a success story. I'm relatively new to LA, but I assume a lot of the folks in the audience uh, have lived here uh, for quite some time, and you remember the pollution from before, right? I mean, the 40s and 50s, the, the pictures of pollution in LA look like pictures of pollution in, in Beijing today, and it's been a, a story of steady progress. 
you know, the Clean Air Act has been very important to air pollution in, in the states, and uh, we, we have a very strong apparatus in the South Coast Air, air Quality Management District, Cal EPA, has worked hard over the last few decades. Um, and uh, Beijing is, is very much trying to learn from the California experience uh, in terms of pollution regulation, in terms of changing the energy mix, in terms of energy efficiency, these types of things. And so I think there's a lot to learn there. Great. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next set of alternative facts, uh, truths, lies. We'll, we'll decide. Okay. And we're going to have Alex H. run us through these. All right. The average CO2 emitted every year to get imported water to one Angelino is about equal to the weight of Dodger's slugger, Yasiel Puig. Too soon. <laughs> the average CO2 emitted every year to get imported water to one Angelino is about equal to what's emitted in China to produce the goods that same Angelino consumes in one year. So imported water for one Angelino versus what they consume from China. And the third one is the average CO2 emitted by one Angelino to get around town every year is more than 10 times bigger than what's emitted in China to produce the goods that same Angelino consumes in a year. Okay, everybody, get out your phones and we can cue the music. Oh, this is fun to watch. <laughs> so I want to introduce a new unit of measure, which is the Puig. That's, that's, um, <laughs> it's a weight of CO2 emitted. Can you estimate what a Puig is? So a Puig is about a tenth of a metric ton. What is that in pounds? That's about 240 pounds. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit less than that, actually. So give or take. That's what we're going to guess his weight is, okay? Um, all right, so it turns out that, um, that um, it, it takes about one Puig to get imported water to L.A. every year. That's how much is emitted to get the water from Northern California to Southern California to urban areas to, um, to supply us with water. And that's mainly through the State Water Project and the California Aqueduct. So pumping that water over the Tehachapis takes a lot of energy. That's a big source of emissions in California. So that's one Puig. Um, it takes 12 Puigs to produce the goods that that Angelino consumes. So number two is actually the lie. Um, the emissions that are emitted in China to supply us with goods are actually substantial, and they're about 12 times greater than the emissions from the California aqueduct. But um, it takes 400 puigs for us to get around every year. So for, that's how much weight in CO2 is emitted every year by the average person in California, in Los Angeles, to get around town. Is so that driving, assuming that's driving. mainly driving, yes. So um, almost half our, our greenhouse gas emissions come from um, transportation or, or, or mainly automobile emissions. So um, number two is, is actually the lie, and, and numbers one and three are true. Okay, so. How do Angelinos compare to other Americans? And are there unique factors that lower or increase Angelinos emissions relative to others? I don't think we're that different. There are a couple of ways in which we are. We, we do have a bit, of a, a bit of a larger transportation footprint um, than a city like, say, New York, um, because we have not yet developed our public transit infrastructure to the, to the degree that we need to. Um, and. Um, we're also a little bit better in the sense that we now get um, a substantial chunk of our electricity from renewable sources. So um, if you plug in um, a device or um, a vehicle, um, you're actually um, not, not, not emitting nearly as much as, as, um, as people in other places that, that rely on coal, for example, or, or natural gas for electricity generation. Okay, so we're talking about personal emissions, and I'm hoping there are some in the audience that are wondering how you might reduce yours. 
Um, if you want to reduce your personal, personal emissions, where's a great, a good place to start? Well, I think for, as you might imagine, from the last, um, the last fa alternative fact out there that actually is a fact, um, that the, the emissions from, from transportation is, is, is a place to start. Almost half our emissions come from transportation, if not maybe a little bit more in, in Los Angeles. So um, that's, that's really a, a low-hanging fruit. Um, about five months ago or so, I bought an electric car, um, and it's phenomenal. I, I like it for many reasons apart from its emissions footprint. Um, they're just amazing pieces of engineering and they, they really um, are, are fantastic. So I highly recommend taking that step. And um, once you convert to an electric vehicle, you wonder why you ever had the other kind of car. <laughs> and from what you were saying, you don't have to give up style and substance either with, your, with the electric car. I mean, I think a lot of times people think you're having to give something up by making these decisions. So I've been, over the past five year, years or so, making, attempting to attack different aspects of my own personal sustainability. And um, every step that I've taken has ended up making my life better um, in some important way. Um, so I, I think it really is true that it, it can be a better world um, in terms of quality of life um, by, by becoming sustainable. So. Does reducing your personal emissions really make a difference in the grand scheme of things? Can you and do you make a difference by doing that, or do? You so there's there's something that I think we have to ignite if we want to truly address um, climate change, and that is um, social contagion. We have to adopt change so that other people will notice and adopt change as well. That's how. That's how, really how change happens, I think, in the end. And, and it might even be um, a good thing that we um, don't have anything happening in Washington or, or, we, or we have the opposite of action. We have people trying to go in, go in reverse. Um, because I think it, it, it underscores the fact that it is up to us to make these changes. It's, it's the decisions, decisions that we make that ultimately will make a difference. And, um, I know like people, my neighbors ask me about my car all the time because they think it's so interesting that I have this thing and so it, it's a conversation starter and um, I was thrilled the other day, so I saw one of my neighbors driving down the street with his own electric car <laughs> and I thought, yes, I convinced this person. So I, I think it really does make a difference and I think that's the only way we'll eventually overcome this is if we all chip in. Yeah, could I, you know, to make a, a point, also relate, a related point about China is that um, on per capita emissions, you know, if you looked at it 10 years ago, China was less than both the United States and Europe. And in terms of sort of aspirational goals, what they would like to be in terms of development is either the U.S. or Europe. Yet the carbon profiles, the carbon footprints of the two places are, are very different, right? So um, the U.S. Is, uh, is about twice what China's is now, and just recently, China's per capita carbon footprint just surpassed Europe's. So 10 years ago, China was less than both. Recently, China has surpassed Europe's average and is still about half of the U.S. And so how China goes in the future, does it become more Europe-like or more U.S.-like, makes a big difference. And then if people, uh, more people act like Alex, then uh, we would become, we would start to lower our footprint as well. Well, that's another reason for us in California to make these steps because I think it's a demonstration that, that there's not an incompatibility with, between sustainability and, and, and prosperity. Right. Can I ahead. ask a quick question? Yeah. So <clears throat> a question people ask me a lot, Alex, is um, if, if you take the carbon footprint of the electricity that, is, that we need in order to run that car, how does that compare to, you know, a 50 mile per gallon Toyota um, that's running off of gasoline? Do you, do you know how those compare? Um, well, it depends on what the electricity source is. If it's a coal-fired electricity plant, that's right. a dif that's different from. Well, here. Um, but here, here in LA, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, we we um, we get a substantial fraction of our power in Los Angeles from renewable sources, and it's an increasing fraction. There's a mandate to increase that, and there's a a real commitment on the part of local utilities to increase um, reliance on renewables. So, um, I, you know, I think it's almost half 
um, in, in, in Los Angeles now that comes from renewables. And the other important thing is, you know, we have to not only reduce our carbon footprint, but we have to invest in infrastructure that will allow us to reduce it in the future. And that this, these sorts of choices, even though they are not necessarily zero carbon, because there is carbon emitted from electricity, they're, they're investments in infrastructure that can become carbon free later. And I think that's also a, a key, um, key point to make. Thanks. Okay, so Brad, you're going to take us through the next round. Um, and on about biodiversity. So the first is Beijing, with a human population of roughly 20 million, is home to about twice as many native bird species as Los Angeles County, with a human population of 10 million. So twice as many people, twice as many species of birds, better biodiversity. The second is urban park size is the primary determinant of bird biodiversity in Beijing. Bigger parks have more species of birds. And the third is that previously unknown species, unknown to science entirely, are regularly discovered in megacities such as Beijing, LA, and New York. One of those is false. Okay, so get out your phones and start the timer music. Okay, we're going to take a look. What are people saying here? Oh, this is interesting. So there seems to be agreement that the lie, well, a majority of you, let's see. We'll give it a second. I want to give it a second. Yeah, let's see what happens. Majority looks to be going with number three as the lie. So Alex... Can you tell us, or Brad, see this is, I should yep. just, all of you, Alex. Okay, we Brad, can Alex. you please That's tell right. us the lie? So, the question is, um, which is the lie? And in this case, um, the lie, interestingly enough, is number two, the one that the fewest people chose. Um, so, so let's talk about this for a minute, okay? So the lie is urban park size is the primary determinant of bird biodiversity in Beijing. Bigger parks have more bird species, more species of birds. Makes a ton of sense, right? Big area, more species. But the thing you have to think about is, imagine that you make a really big park and it's a giant lawn, okay? Are you gonna have a lot of species of birds or anything else? And the answer is no. You're gonna have a lot of pigeons, okay? <laughs> And so you may have a whole lot of individual birds or individual insects, but the diversity, the types that we care about so much as conservation scientists and biodiversity scientists is going to be really low. Now, what matters is a little less about size and a little more about the environmental heterogeneity. So if that park has big trees and little trees and shrubs and grass and a stream and a pond and a, you know, different things like that, different soil types, then you'll get a lot of biodiversity. Now, you know, the fact is, is that usually bigger chunks of land have more environmental heterogeneity, so also have more, more species, but it's not always the case. And it turns out there was a really interesting study published um, very recently on 10 urban parks in Beijing, and they parsed all that out. And what they found was that size was relatively, was essentially uncorrelated with the number of species of birds, but, um, but environmental heterogeneity um, was very highly correlated. So if we, if we go through the other two just real quickly, um, Beijing is home to twice as many native species of birds, of birds as, as Los Angeles, which I found um, pretty astonishing. So the numbers are, there's 435 species of birds found in, in Beijing, and um, iNaturalist, which is, is a great source for, uh, for birds, at least in, in California, shows 211 species in LA County. Another thing that I find amazing is that 
211 species of birds in LA County, about 800 species of birds in California, and 200 species in Griffith Park. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. And then the third is previously unknown species are regularly discovered in megacities. Well, and, and we need go no further than, than Luis Chape, our, our uh, host who introduced us, um, and uh, to the curator of insects over at the Natural History Museum, Brian Brown, who uh, last I checked had discovered 43 new species of one family of flies in Los Angeles that he collected. These are new to science. Nobody knew these things existed. And as just one other example, um, three or four years ago, we found the first new species of frog that had been discovered in 100 years in the East Coast. And we found it on Staten Island in New York City. So there are certainly, there is lots of biodiversity and lots of interesting new discoveries to be made in cities. There's the answers. Okay, so the moral of the story is big cities are important for biodiversity, which is not what you might necessarily expect. Which is not what you might expect. And, okay. uh, and that's my big moral of this story, is that as conservation biologists, and especially when we think about conservation in the future with climate change, um, we should not write off big cities is in terms of their importance for biodiversity. I mean, you know, LA is never going to be as important as Yosemite, but, but it's, it's really important. And just as one example of this, um, this morning I have about a three mile walk from, from my house up to UCLA, and I, I look for birds a lot, I like to bird watch. And this morning in that walk, in about 50 minutes, um, I tallied 17 species of birds. And 17 species of birds in my little walk up Veteran Avenue on the west side of LA is, um, is about two per, is about 3% of the total birds that you get in California, and it's about 2% of the total birds you get in the United States. And that's in one little walk in LA. So, I think it just says there's a lot of biodiversity here and, and it's really important that we preserve it. So um, I remember there was a t-shirt in my department in grad school that said adapt, migrate, or die. And um, I'm wondering what we're seeing in terms of patterns with bird populations, with climate change. Are we seeing adaptations? Are we seeing migrations? Are we seeing extinctions? What's happening there? Yeah, and I think the answer is is that we're seeing all three. Um, we are we are seeing um, right here in California, certainly as well as in Beijing. I was just reading a paper about this the other day. Um, we're certainly seeing sort of a combination of adaptation and and migration. So, just as a for instance, um, a number of different kinds of birds that used to be migratory are becoming non-migratory. There's a very common bird in LA called a junco, a dark-eyed junco, little sparrow, and uh, like bird. And um, juncos always were migratory, and suddenly they're becoming resident. They, this first happened in San Diego. It's now happening in, in LA. Um, Canada geese, if you ever go, especially to the east, used to always be migratory. They've just decided to settle down because it's not that, that cold anymore. Um, we are also certainly seeing extinctions and, and plenty of those um, that are associated with climate change, at least local extinctions. I would say great. Let's move on, but it's not great. So. Well, you know, <laughs> good but thanks. Bad. Thanks, Fred. Okay, so we're going to move on to um, Alex H. and sea level rise. Get some ocean, ocean action in here. All right. The percent of the population whose homes would be underwater with projected sea level rise is much lower in the LA metropolitan area than in greater Beijing, which includes Tianjin, and which is a, it's a big metropolitan area there. The percent of the population whose homes would be underwater with projected sea level rise is about the same in Miami as it is in Shanghai. And the third one, the metropolitan region and the, with the largest likely economic damage associated with projected sea level rise 
is in the United States. Okay, so get out your phones and cue the music. Looks like there is some agreement amongst this crowd. Alex, can you tell us which one yeah, is the I'm lie? Yeah, it's funny because um, this does not speak well for crowdsourcing <laughs> information. <laughs> or, or, or maybe just we need to do a better job of um, talking about this stuff. <laughs> um, so, okay, so it turns out that... Um, if you look at um, what, what sea level rise, sea level rise would have, might eventually occur with a two degree warming, which is a pretty modest warming, about 3% of the homes in Southern California would be underwater. Um, and in the greater Beijing, Tianjin area, that's, that number is about, about, about 6 or 7%. So it's actually quite a bit higher um, in, in, in Beijing. So, that, so number one is true. Um, and if you, but there are other metropolitan areas that are much more impacted. Um, Miami in the U.S. is a big poster child for the impacts of sea level rise. Um, and something like 40% of the homes would be underwater with that level of, of warming. Um, and the number is actually similar for, for Shanghai, which is also um, built on a, in a fairly low-lying area. Um, a lot of reclaimed land and, and, and similar dynamics to what you find in, in places like Miami and New York. So, um, so number two is also um, true. Um, and it turns out that um, the metropolitan region that would have the largest economic damage associated with sea level rise um, is actually not in the US. It turns out it's um, this urban agglomeration of Shenzhen and Guangzhou, um, which is near Hong Kong. This is a metro a, a, an urban area that um, was built up um, over the past 20 years or so, I think. And, um, and has become a, a megacity almost over, you know, re really very quickly. Um, and it was built on very low-lying areas in the Pearl River Delta. Um, and it is extremely vulnerable to, to, um, to sea level rise um, and, and um, because there is now quite a bit of expensive real estate um, near, the, near, near the coast in this area, um, it's, it's, it would be um, heavily hit economically by, by sea level rise. Um, so, number three is the number three is the lie. Okay, so I think when people think about sea level rise, they might think of flooding, and but not necessarily what what the impacts or what the what is going to actually happen. So, can you describe to us what kind of impacts we should expect in areas that are going to experience significant sea level rise? So of course there's the um, there's the flooding that, that occurs when, when sea level rises and, and typically that, that you know we we could expect that to occur in big storm events um, where because the sea margin of course is not constant it changes with time and there are um, big big storms that can bring storm surges and if they coincide with high tide that can bring a lot of water inland um, but there are other big effects that are more insidious and and, and in some ways more more difficult. Um, one is saltwater intrusion. So a lot of um, cities rely on groundwater for um, their water supply. Miami is an example of this. Um, and Miami is currently experiencing real problems with its water supply because the water quality is, is deteriorated. It's become a lot more saline because the ocean water is intruding underneath the land. Um, that's one example. There are cities with a lot of underground infrastructure. Um, New York is a great example of that. Um, but many, many cities have subways and, and, and you know, sewer lines that are, that are close to sea level or below sea level. Um, that infrastructure is also um, really vulnerable. So those are some examples of other impacts of sea level rise. Yeah, I've heard nightmare stories from Hurricane Sandy when people's <laughs> septic systems backed up and they just had sewage in their basements because of so much water. That's not, becoming a more regular thing, not just with storms, but... I was going to make a poop joke there, but I... <laughs> like you said earlier, I'm not going to do Anytime. it. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. I know how much you like that. 
So, okay, so what factors play a role in determining the impact of sea level rise? What's happening? There must be differences depending on where you are and maybe what the coastal habitats look like or... So there are big differences, and you know, LA is, a, is an interesting example. Um, as challenged as we are by, by climate change, um, particularly in, in water resources, sea level rise is not, not as damaging here as in other places, and that's mainly because we um, have, a, have pretty high topography in most of, most of the urbanized landscape. That's not true in the marina. Marina del Rey is very vulnerable, and, and the ports are also vulnerable infrastructure in Southern California. But, it's, it's nothing compared to um, you know, cities like, like Miami, um, where much of the urbanized fabric is, is um, very near sea level, within a meter or two of sea level. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, um, Shanghai, these are New York is another example of um, a city where there's a lot of infrastructure very near, near sea level, and, and that's also a big factor. The other factor is there are the, the frequency of storms um, and the types of storms that occur. So Miami is, is vulnerable because hurricanes occur in that part of the world. We don't have hurricanes in, in Los Angeles, so we don't have the types of storm surges that are associated with um, those big events. So why do you think it's so hard for people to grasp sea level rise and take action? Because it's, I know I live in North Carolina, coastal North Carolina, and we're getting surrounded by the sea and people are just in complete denial about it. So why is it so hard? I think it, it gets at the, the time frame question that you raised um, at the beginning of, of the evening. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the sea level is, ri is rising slowly. Um, if we, we're projecting conservatively a meter of sea level rise over the next century, over the next century or so, um, you know, every year that's, you know, um, a centimeter. Um, so that's, that's not, not noticeable enough. Uh, um, and, and, and so it's not something that people are motivated to confront. On the other hand, they are motivated to confront the impacts of extreme events, like um, if a hurricane brings in a storm surge, um, that can be made worse by sea level rise and areas that don't normally get inundated would get inundated. But then we had this habit when the extreme event is over of rebuilding the way things were. And we don't take into account the fact that slowly things are changing. So I think our, our habits, our rebuilding habits um, have, have to change. We have to start planning for the future when there are extreme events um, you know, so, so, that, so that we can cope better going forward. Right, we need to start facing, facing reality. Facing reality. Um, Interesting, in Florida, um, anyone in government's not allowed to mention climate change? It's the same situation in North Carolina. They don't calculate it properly. They use old models. And they have started to allow people to use the word sea level rise. Um, so you can't talk about what's causing it, but you can talk about the fact that it's happening, and I guess that's some kind of progress. <laughs> Take what you can get. Um, okay, thanks. We're going we're gonna to move on to Brad, and we're going to talk about something that's on the minds of many uh, right now. Right. So we want to talk about fire, and fire is associated with climate change because it gets hotter, it gets drier, and certainly in some parts of the world at least, that means there's more fires. So fire and biodiversity, first, quest, or first uh, point. Small animals, including native mice, lizards, and toads, experience huge mortality during wildfires, whereas large animals, like deer and bobcats, experience minor mortality. Number two, bird populations are often more negatively affected by wildfires than any other group of vertebrate animals. And vertebrates are fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Number three is a study in the Santa Monica Mountains, just adjacent to LA, found that active revegetation with native seeds following wildfire was actually worse for native plant and animal recovery than simply letting natural revegetation re occur. Okay. So once okay. Get out your phones and cue the music. I 
can't wait to see how this one goes. Sort of feels like the World Series, you know. Winning. <laughs> Too soon. We good? What do you think? Yeah, I think we should tell us. Tell us. Which is the lie? do it. So, which is the lie? And it turns out this time you guys were right. The lie is A. The lie is, is the first one. Small animals, including native mice and lizards and my, my pals, lizards and toads and stuff, um, experience huge mortality during wildfires, whereas large animals like deer and bobcat experience minor. And, the reason why it's a lie is, is, is kind of interesting and I think speaks to a slightly broader point, which is that um, wildfires and their impacts on, on animals and plants, I mean, especially animals, um, they're, they're just very, very idiosyncratic. It, the, the devil is in the details with wildfires. It depends on the nesting season with birds, it's just game over, and it's kind of game over for everybody. And so it can be truly devastating for bird populations. Called renewable energy capacity, it's wind, solar, hydro, uh, in 2016 exceeded the total generating capacity, uh, this is all uh, generating capacity in Japan and Germany combined. Okay, get out your phone. how you learn. Okay, Alex, can you tell us which is the lie? Okay, so, so two of these sort of uh, take advantage of the fact that China is just a very populous country. It's like the old saying that if you sell a pair of socks to every Chinese person, then you're a billionaire, right? So, so the, first one, uh, the first one and the third one are true. Two turns out to be the lie, okay? Um, now, in terms of uh, why number two is a lie, I test, test marketed this on my wife, and I'll out her and say that uh, she picked two, but for the wrong reason. So she thought, and maybe some people you know, are like her, thought, no, it couldn't possibly peak that soon. Okay, so China's pledge under the Paris Agreement was, was that they would uh, peak their sort of uh, carbon emissions by 2030. Right, and there have been estimates about coal consumption peaking maybe sometime around, around here. But uh, the data has shown that over the last three years, China's coal consumption has already been going down, 2014, 2015, 2016. The one glitch was just this past week. There was some preliminary data about the first three quarters of 2017, which show that coal use is up again a little bit. So people had been saying, oh, is this peak coal? Has coal been uh, reached, reached, its, uh, reached the top? And China's had a massive sort of, they've set coal caps for parts of the country and had a very concerted effort to, to sort of stop new development of coal plants and that sort of thing. And so, so um, it turns out that there's a possibility that they have already peaked, uh, but we're not sure just yet. Uh, in terms of number one, that turns out to be true. It's a little bit stunning, right, that China just uses a lot of coal. They, about 70% uh, of their electricity comes from uh, coal. It's only about 30% in the U.S. Um, and uh, this is one of those things. China is just a big country, but they also use a lot of coal to generate their energy. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the first one is sort of the bad news. The second one is potentially some good news. And the third one is also one of the more interesting developments to be watching, right? So China has a tremendous amount of coal use that uh, contributes to the rapid rise in carbon emissions in China, but they are also the top investor in renewable energy, wind and solar. 
they, they invest and support wind and solar so much that it's leading to sort of trade, unfair trade cases, right? People are complaining that there's too much subsidy for these industries in China, but the result has been some real changes in, in terms of the prices of solar panels going down and, and really creating markets for uh, renewables. And this, this is also a, a fact that just China has one of the largest installed uh, generating capacity bases in the world, and so they happen to have a lot of renewable energy, but that's a real uh, that's a real real thing, right? That the, their amount of renewable energy is more than all of the energy capacity in Japan, uh, in, in Germany. And so looking forward, one of the questions, th this point that Alex H. raised earlier about sort of carbon emissions in trade is very important. That w It's important that we stop thinking only about emissions within a country, right? So uh, a sort of American and European consumption, we need to think about the impacts in other countries. Likewise, China has been announcing uh, for some time now a sort of going out strategy of investing in other countries. And the way they invest in other countries will have a big impact on future carbon pathways. Do they put more money into renewable energy? There's, there's actually a lot of investment in renewables, but there's also s evidence that they're investing quite a lot in, in coal and, and uh, heavily polluting industries. So, Alex, I think a lot of people um equate reducing, reductions in emissions with um, scaling back growth and development. Does reducing emissions mean we need to reduce our growth and development? So, so one of the, um, the graphs, uh, if, if you ever visit the EPA, uh, the federal uh, EPA, um, th one of the things they love to, to show is this, there's a graph showing uh, a number of metrics from you know, 1970 or 1980 to now, and it includes sort of GDP growth, miles traveled, population, sort of markers of development. And then the other metrics are uh, the criteria pollutants, the six pollutants that uh, the Clean Air Act mainly uh, regulates, and carbon emissions. And so the point is that, look, the U.S. has grown its economy. We've been able to do the things we want to do, yet pollution is way down. It's down something like six, 67 or 70 percent over that time. Carbon is not down, but it's delinked in a way from, uh, from growth. It, grow, it has grown less quickly than uh, the GDP growth. And so the point is, look, the idea is to promote this idea that, look, the benefits, we can get a lot of benefits and still do the types of things that we want. It's not just a story of, of, of sort of sacrificing. And in China right now, the mantra is this sort of trying to do green development, uh, or they have a term called ecological civilization that they're putting on. So this idea that, look, you can grow the economy and uh, become greener. And so th th what they would like to do is to do something akin to what the U.S. Has, has been able to do over the last few decades. So that's a good way to end on a note of optimism. Positive note, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. What we're going to do now is go back and give you guys a chance to, I think the next thing is to ask a question, right? And so we've... Let me make sure I have this. Okay, so you can ask a question, right? Am I, do I have this right? You can ask a question, and um, then you get to vote on which question you want answered. So we'll probably put like, three or four questions up there, and then the audience can choose what they actually want to have answered. And that should be in your phone. Burning questions. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> That's distracting when you're trying to ask a question. <laughs> the music is. So they can see the questions. Yeah, they're going to be able to see the questions. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> that was a mistake. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have brought that up. I'm not answering that. <laughs> but wait, let's see. Somebody else must have a question. Come on. <laughs> okay, so let's... <laughs> Got some comedians tonight. Okay. <clears throat> No, we are not answering the poop question. 
Let's stay on topic. That's Alex H's question. <laughs> <laughs> well, number, the, the livestock growth thing could be linked to a, not a joke, a poop joke, but. A, a gas joke? A gas joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we, let's, um, let's see. What is the best way to shut down a climate change denier? Does, do we, does anybody want to tackle that? I, I don't, I, I actually question the framing of the question. Um, I don't think anyone should be shut down. And, and I think the, the best way to talk to people is to truly engage them. Um, I, I think that people want to be listened to. Um, we live in this world where on Facebook and Twitter, everyone's denigrating everyone else. And, and um, I think you know, the most important thing is to listen to people. So I, I, I think, you know, I think, I think talking to people is, is more important than shutting them down. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with that in, in this, the sense that I think some of the, the opposition to the, the reality of climate change is uh, sort of tribal behavior in a sense, sort of what well, my community doesn't believe in it, so I'm just, maybe I don't know, so I'll just follow along. And I think being uh, willing to engage is a way to sort of break down uh, those those barriers, um, yeah. So, yeah. so oh, I was oh, just going to oh. say, with the shutting down, let's take that out of the picture and maybe rephrase it and ask: Is there something, a, f a fact, an experience, a story that you share, you would share with a climate denier to engage them? Something that's compelling enough to get them to stop and think. I, I actually think the most powerful thing that we can do is change our behavior and. And, and talk to people about our behaviors and get the conversation away from how much is the earth warmed and how much will it warm and what, is, what are the effects of that. And I, I think it, it, if we can change the way that we behave and talk to people about that, I think that's very effective. Um, you know, the example that I like to give again is the electric car. That's a, that's a cool thing. That, that's a new thing that, that's fun to talk about. I think that's a connection point. Um, so talking about solutions and, and, and how those can help us and, and make our lives better. Um, yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, I mean, I think a really effective way um, to reach people, and you know, maybe, maybe this speaks to my age a little bit, but um, is, is if you have personal experiences. So I was raised in, in southern New England. I was raised in Connecticut. And, you know, I can literally remember, you know, years and decades where you had to go out there and shovel snow every year um, in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And you don't anymore. And, and you can, over, you know, my 60-odd years, you can, you can see that, that difference. And I think those, those individual personal stories and individual personal connections, even if they are just anecdotes, um, I think can go a long way and, and can again be a very kind of powerful way to, to just discuss the fact that the world is changing and, and has changed. Yeah, I would encourage anybody that didn't attend um, the first night of this series, um, it's available to go back and listen to. There was actually a lot of discussion about this topic and engaging with folks that um, have an issue with climate change and accepting the reality of it, uh, there was some really great advice there. So, and, and there was the mention in that first, I, I'm not forgetting the name of the app, but there was an app mention that actually lists the top sort of claims of people who deny and then right. the climate science dot skeptical science dot org. And then it provides sort of uh, links to the research that, that responds to those. That right. seemed a very good practical, yeah. Yeah, we have a user here, yeah. Great. So we are going to do the final act of the evening is to check back in and see if so many of you still feel juiced. We're going to do one, a one-word response again um, that describes when you feel about when you, how you feel when talking <laughs> to someone about climate change. Come talk to us. Who are these people? I don't know. No. <laughs> The comedians are in full effect. We promised not to moderate. <laughs> Hopeful, nervous, motivated, educated, super juiced. <laughs> the 
truthful, ignorant. Is that because you got the, the, the game wrong? You missed the questions on the game? For Klempt. This is great. This is great. Well, hopefully we added to your knowledge and understanding of what's happening around climate change this evening. I really, I want to um, thank our panelists tonight. I really appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge with us. And I also want to thank the museum for hosting this event and hosting the entire series. I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn from a lot of different people that are locally here um, with all this expertise to, um, that we can, the community can really benefit from. Um, there's one more part. This is a four-part series. And the next part is two weeks from tonight, um, November 16th. Um, this is going to be a completely different take. Um, it's called Imagining Futures for a Hotter Planet. And the panelists will be poets and artists and other creative types. Um, and they're going to be bringing a whole different perspective to this discussion. So um, I hope you can join us. If you can't come in person, you can live stream. It's actually been working really well. So um, share with others that it's available to them, because I believe all these events are um, sold out. And thank you for coming tonight and participating. Thank you.